first class of my Virginia Theological Seminary course on poverty, God, and politics was just great. I think it was uh, 11 on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, this class has drawn, drawn together a really great group of people, very committed people. And it turned out we spent uh, the whole session introducing ourselves. And in the process, uh, each of us sharing the passions and concerns that we're bringing to this discussion. So now I, it seems to me we should uh, move forward by reflecting on what we learn from each other. And uh, that process starts with this video. I intend to share this video with uh, people across the country. Uh, not everybody can come to Alexandria, Virginia, and um, but some of you are interested in learning with us. Uh, I, I think the, the fact that this is a, a course that's happening among people from one place uh, gives it a, will give it a special practicality. It really grounds it uh, compared to something that is talking about what's ha happening nationwide. All the people in this class were very service oriented. Um, quite a few of them are leaders in their churches, their communities, in society. Uh, all of us, I think, are alarmed by all the problems that our, fa our country faces now and by the dysfunctionality of our politics. And um, most hopefully, I think everybody in the class is asking the question uh, on an ongoing basis, what does God want, want me to do now? What does God want me to do now? And my guess is that anybody who watches one of these videos is also asking that question. What does God want me to do now? Um, after, after the class, I went back through what people said and kind of did a chart on what, what are the, to look at what are the patterns. Um, well, one pattern was these uh, common strengths. But another pattern was that it seems to me that really we're not very involved in the politics of our country or the politics of poverty specifically. Overwhelmingly, we're involved in assistance to people in need, and that is as it should be. Um, people are helping their family and friends, especially elderly people, children. Uh, we're almost all involved in service programs, assistance programs to people in need, um, but not so much involved. Some of us are involved in social change, but even then, maybe not in uh, the strongest and most effective political ways. In Alexandria, uh, the socially aware churches are struggling with two current waves of need and then underlying a lot of just ongoing need. One wave of need has been the Afghan refugees. Uh, they're getting, uh, they are eligible for several federal programs, but um, they're, they're gonna need more help than that in order to get up on their feet and and uh, establish themselves in this very different country. And so in Alexandria and across the country, a, a lot of churches are adopting Afghan refugee families. God bless them for it, uh, but it's a big project. And then uh, just in the last few days, the state of Virginia announced that they are stopping pandemic rental assistance. And I'm told that court dockets are already filling up with eviction cases. Over the last couple of years, the churches of Alexandria have been doing a great job, Herculean job, in getting assistance out to the families who need it, many of them Spanish-speaking families. But now uh, there is not going to be any more assistance. So what do we do now? And then there is an underlying need. One woman in the class who spends a lot of her time on the phone 
with uh, families who uh, are asking for help, uh, you know, expressed some some almost not despair, but something like that. Um, just her sense was that, you know, families are sinking. Uh, that um, a lot of people, they're responsible, they're trying to take care of their kids, but maybe they're not qualified to get the jobs that are available. There's nothing that can be done. Um, the, the church doesn't have enough assistance to offer them to meet their needs. Uh, and I, I think one reason why we may be getting that feeling now here in, in Alexandria is that Congress has decided, is deciding to stop pandemic assistance programs. The biggest one that stopped was the expanded child tax credit. In the spring, uh, Congress agreed to expand benefits to virtually all families with children, and then importantly, to make the child tax credit fully available to the poorest families. It was a big change. Um, because in the past, the very poorest families got nothing from that program. Um, now, in December, um, that needed to be extended. The Build Back Better Act didn't pass. It failed by one vote. So in January, the Census Bureau tells us that child poverty increased by 40%. So then comes the end of rental assistance in Virginia. Uh, it's no wonder families are sinking. What I would propose is that every person, every agency, every church that provides assistance to people in need, that we allocate 10% of our time and money, uh, that we don't, 10% of what we do to help poor people should go to political things, uh, certainly advocacy, to, to get the money that we need from our state and federal governments, from the city, and then also to uh, shape those programs so that they, that they work well on the ground in our communities. Um, I'm struck that uh, with the federal assistance for uh, rent, rent, my sense is that a lot of the people who've been helping to, to get that assistance out, they may not even know that it is federal assistance because it comes through the state of Virginia, then it comes through a charity. Neither the state of Virginia or the charity really publicize the fact that the money comes from the federal government. So um, then we're caught by surprise uh, when, when the aid stops. It's a decision that was made some time ago. I was really pleased that a number of people in the class are also involved in social change, that is trying to make bigger changes that um, will take time but will have an impact, bigger impact. One of those areas is uh, racial education and reconciliation. It is so important. I really appreciate that uh, work. I think uh, many of us have learned more about the history of racism, the structures of racism in our country, how there are laws and structures uh, that still uh, are adverse for people of color. Um, I learned in my local church that uh, Alexandria was the hub of the slave trade from Virginia down to the plantations of the Deep South in the decades before the Civil War. I didn't know that. There's a slave market, a building that used to be a slave market about two miles from my house. And I didn't know that. It's just in the last five years that I've learned that. I should have known, but I didn't know. Um, some of the people in the class are now leaders of uh, anti-racism education in the churches. Um, and then one person uh, actually um, wanted to find out about, there's a slavery museum in the basement of the building where the Urban League has its um, office. They had shut the slavery museum because they didn't have money to maintain it, to keep it open. 
But he just knocked on the door long enough until somebody finally came to the door and said, well, I guess I have to show you. So, <laughs> so then, you know, it's a very, very impressive place. Um, it used to be a slave market. And in the basement, you still see the shackles cemented into the wall where enslaved people were held. So this person went to the mayor of Alexandria, got him to come see the museum, and that ended up in uh, the city of Alexandria providing the funds to allow the museum to open again. That is really powerful action, and um, I'm impressed. Uh, but I think we could do more in the area of uh, racial politics. The current governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, um, probably got elected because he decided to underline to reinforce the suspicions of parents who thought maybe racial education was going too far in the schools, that it was making their children feel uncomfortable because they're white, that, that they should feel guilty because they're white. Um, now, the Governor Youngkin's having that investigated, but already there's no question in my mind that um, what he's done has um, discouraged teachers from even talking about race in our public schools. And it seems to me that one, one fruit of racial education in the churches should be stronger or participation in broader organized efforts to push back against um, what Governor Youngkin and um, a number of Republican politicians across the country are doing to, to uh, suppress racial education. Also, this, this year is uh, an election year. It is really, really, really important that people of color vote. Over the last two years, a number, uh, quite a few Republican legislatures across the country have passed legislation that will make it more difficult for people of color to vote uh, this fall. That was the purpose of that legislation. Uh, we failed to stop it. But now there are really good organizations, the Skinner Institute, for example, that's helping to organize uh, efforts, especially in swing states, to, um, to, um, to mobilize people of color to vote, to encourage them to vote, and also to be at polling places where there's some risk of intimidation against voting. Uh, seems to me these kinds of, frankly, political activities should uh, be strengthened by the racial education that we do in churches. The other thing I was glad to see was that several people have signed up with the Poor People's Campaign. It's a really important organization with a lot of long-term potential. Um, but um, it's a visionary organization. It has a long-term agenda, radical agenda. Um, I think we should support it. But we also need organizations like Bread for the World and the Denominational Advocacy Networks uh, that work on political changes that can be made right now, policy changes. Uh, that are possible this year, this month. And in fact, this month, May, I think is our last chance to get an economic reconciliation bill. The Build Back Better bill uh, died by with one, we had, we were one vote short in the Senate in December. Uh, Schumer and Biden and Manchin are now talking about how to get into formal negotiations and then to see if they can craft a bill that all 50 uh, Democratic senators will vote for. The moderate Democrats, people like uh, Senator Kane and Senator Warner from Virginia, are crucial. So here in Virginia, we need to be on the phone to Kane's office, Warner's office, email to those two offices, and say we want them to get the reconciliation bill done this month. We want them to include anti-poverty provisions. That's not a given. And uh, we specifically want them to make the child tax credit, again, fully available to the poorest families. They need to hear that from us uh, to give it a chance of passage uh, this month. 
in closing, I wonder, is it, is it generally true that even socially committed Christians tend to shy away from political involvement, giving money and time to candidates, joining, being active in a political party, being active in specific, concrete public policy advocacy. Is it true that um, maybe that we want our congregations to be bipartisan, but maybe the Met, because of that concern that the congregations should be bipartisan, should include everybody, maybe we never make it clear that individuals should, that partisanship is not necessarily a vice, that we should get involved in politics and certainly push for the things that we think the Lord wants. So we'll be talking about that in uh, class uh, next, next week. And, and I look forward to recording another video next week.